Okay. Hey everyone, we're delighted to have you here today. This is week four of the OLS uh, cohort six and I can see so many amazing faces, uh, including faces where it's actually quite late. I, I believe it's like 9.30 in India right now. So thank you so much for joining. Um, and other people for whom it's actually start of the day. So it's just lovely to have so many people here. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to run through some of the default housekeeping that we go through every call. Um, you'll hear these a lot of times before the end of the cohort. We thank you for your patience. It's important to, to remember a lot of these things as well. Um, so the first thing is that we have a code of conduct. Um, so the too long didn't read version of that is to treat everyone with the respect that you would like to receive uh, in OLS spaces when you're representing OLS or you know generally is, is quite a good idea as well I'll say. <laughs> um, please do take a minute or two to, to look through it maybe when we're not in the call. Um, but the one other thing that I'll add is if you at any point feel like you've either witnessed or experienced something that isn't in line with the expected behavior, then we ask that you report it so that we can keep this community as safe as possible for everyone. Um, and the way to report that, there are two different ways. They both are by email. So if you send an email to team at openlifesci.org, that will re reach all of the organizers. Um, that's myself, Berenice, Emmy, Malvika, and Paz. Um, but it's also possible that it was one of us that is the reason you need to make the report. So you can always um, email any of us individually, and that's always first name at openlifesci.org. And if you look at lines 79 and 80, you can see those email addresses uh, so that you don't have to guess based on accents and, and trying to spell things out is an absolute nightmare. Just uh, too many people interpret vowels in different ways. Um, also, we have Otter AI. Uh, so if you're using Zoom on, on a desktop on the top left of your screen, you'll probably see something that says live on Otter AI. So you also probably got a notification when you joined saying that um, we were streaming. This is not on YouTube. We, the recording will go on YouTube, but we are not streaming live. Um, Otter AI just is there to help people follow along, either um, if you get distracted, um, if English isn't your first language, or if you are hard of hearing or deaf, these are all, this is one way that helps increase participation by automatically transcribing what's being said, but it doesn't work in breakout rooms. Um, so one thing that we ask from everyone is that we, we sort people into written breakout rooms and into spoken breakout rooms so that everyone can participate in the way that's easier for them. You know, if you're in a quiet room with a baby, you might prefer to have a written breakout room than wake up this little person. Um, so what we ask is that if you can go into your name in Zoom, for me, I click on the participants list. And then I go to my name and I click on more beside my name and then I can click rename and in front of my name I'm going to put W which means that I want a written breakout room but if you prefer a spoken breakout room please put S in front of your name and that just helps us sort things out into um, the different rooms that people are going into. Okay, I can see those popping in. Thank you so much, everyone. I'll give a moment more. If you can't do it, for example, if you're on a mobile and you can't, or you can't find the right button or anything like that, we will ask before you we assign you to rooms. So don't worry too much if you get stuck. But most of you have done that. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, bum, bum, bum. I think that's all the default remindery stuff. Um, Malvika, do you want to uh, start? Just checking who hasn't introduced themselves yet and give them a chance to say hello. Yeah, for sure. Um, just want to again say, yeah, if you are okay with both, just choose one. It's It also helps us to identify who should be assigned to which breakout room. Um, and the reason we ask you to edit it in the front is the alphabetical order. It just makes it, again, easy for us. Uh, so can I just get in the chat your name if you haven't had the chance to introduce yourself to the cohort in one of the welcome calls we had in the week two and three. Um, please let me know so I can call you in for a quick intro. So you're, you're on our video in one of the OLS6 videos. And the way you would introduce yourself is in three words. Uh, tell us who you are. Four words, yes. 
Okay. Tell us who you are, where you're based, what your project's name, and what's your most recent hobby. And most recent hobby could be anything, um, cuddling the cat, as Nina has just brought up, or uh, walking ar around, or doing knitting, anything. We're very delighted to hear. So please give me in the chat if you haven't had the chance to introduce yourself. Nilabha, please can you introduce yourself? Thank you, Malvika. <clears throat> you guys can hear me, right? No audio issues. Awesome. Hi, guys. Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm Nilabha Mukherjee. I'm based out of India. Uh, to be more specific, Bangalore, Karnataka, India. Uh, so uh, as the order was mentioned, let me just say that out again. Yeah. So who am I? Uh, I'm a third year undergraduate student pursuing a degree in bioengineering. Uh, so one of the most important things that I feel that justifies who I am is I'm curious. And I think that is one of my driving factors of being part of this cohort in the first place. And it's helping out as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I'm based out of India and, the, and that also links to my project. Uh, as a third year bioengineering student, one of the things that I came to understand is the lack of clear cut well, not clear, but more like goals that undergraduates can have when they're pursuing a career in life sciences in India specifically. So I wanted to do something about it. And I did do something about it when I founded my own bioengineering club in my university. And one of the things that I also came to realize from that is that the professors themselves are not exactly sure what the next step should be. So I figured as open science uh, cohort is one of, the big, uh, one of the most interesting concepts that I ever heard on the internet. Why don't I try and whatever the learnings that I get with my mentor, apply this to my bioengineering chapter so that I can help create something of a legacy in my university and help out my juniors. And in terms of a new hobby that I recently picked up is reading history books. I'm usually, I, I usually uh, like reading uh, fiction and mystery, uh, mystery novels, but now I'm into reading Alexander Julius Caesar, the Mongol Kings. So that's one of the things that I think is the most interesting thing that happened to me during COVID. I just shifted my entire genre of reading because I have a book home myself. So that's me, all the four criteria, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm gonna give it to now Susanna. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you to keep intro short so we can move on to the next part. Susanna, mm -hmm. to you. Hi. Um, yeah, so last time I was introduced, muted, which is why I felt like I hadn't introduced myself. Um, so I will be working on a project here at the Alan Turing. I'm an enrichment student and I'll be trying to work and figure out how I can make science, but more specifically, computational neuroscience uh, more ethical so I try to look at bias in science and as well as reproducibility because it doesn't matter if everything is really reproducible if it's biased to begin with um, so that's that's what I'm trying to do and my hobby recently has been foraging uh, for food which is what I said last time as well that's it have been asked by a five-year-old how do you tell a mushroom is poisonous and I'm like do not trust any mushroom in the wild that's my advice because I don't know thanks so much Susanna Aswati you're our next person to introduce Hi, my name is uh, Aswati and I'm a fourth year uh, uh, PhD student at uh, University of Galway at Ireland and our Project name is uh, AGAP, and it's a uh, it's an initiative to introduce open science, its concepts, and how we can start uh, uh, open science initiatives uh, during the beginning of your uh, PhD. Like it is targeted at uh, early career researchers. And uh, most recent hobby, uh, recently restarted doing jigsaw puzzles. Thank you so much. Uh, lots of jigsaw for winter. Yeah. I'm gonna just quickly ask uh, again, do we have anybody else never introduce themselves to this cohort before we move on to the next part of this call? I'll take that 
silence as no. If not, if if you don't have the chance until today, please go on the Slack, do introduce yourself. We will have a lot more chances to learn about your project via the OLS 6 GitHub. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back. No, pass it to pass for the next session. Um, so now we're gonna go to the uh, breakout rooms, the first ones. Um, so that's gonna be 10 minutes and we're gonna have more or less three people per room. Um, so the, the line in the pad, you can see the line 98. There, there you can see the, the questions that will provoke the conversation uh, in the rooms. So yeah, that's it. I mean, I can tell them, but I mean, yeah, maybe someone has trouble reading right now, but the first question is, is think of a time you were collaborating or working on a project and it was a complete train wreck. Train wreck means like it was awful and difficult, right? So what happened? What made it chaotic? Um, and the other one is think of a time you were collaborating or working on a project, an open project, and everything was perfect or near perfect. Uh, what happened? What made it sublime or or amazing? Yeah. So uh, talk about that with the people, with the other uh, room members. That's it. Are we ready to go to the rooms? Just a minute. Any questions? I mean, about the questions or the I don't know something. <laughs> Thank you, Malvika, for posting in the chat. That is good. Oh. Mm. Yeah, we can, you can answer in the pad or in the chat, whatever you prefer. Maybe someone can post, uh, pass, uh, paste um, what you say in the pad and the chat in the pad. I mean, you decide. Let's do that. Okay. Thank you very much for your breakout room report outs, everyone. Um, so we're going to have a few speakers now. Um, I realize we're almost 40 minutes into the call and we haven't started with the speakers. Yikes, let's get going. Um, so we're basically asking, uh, our speakers are sharing some different ways that you can tell people how to um, interact with your project in ways that makes it legal, makes it well documented. As we've noted, documentation is super important and that makes it clear so people know what's going on. Uh, without further ado, we have Anna Esso, who is going to be working on, uh, who's going to share licensing information. Anna, over to you. Just one moment. There we go. And I'm going to... <laughs> to get the slides going. This is the first time I'm using this laptop for <laughs> for doing a couple of things. If, if someone can uh, share the slides for me, so you can help me out. Yeah, if you want to send send me your link. Oh, I can see them. I can do this. But yeah, the the link is on. Okay, just let me know when you need another page. Oh, no, I should do a slideshow. I send you your the link. Thank you. And if I share screen and I do that. Is this, this is the importance of past people? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is this the right screen? Yes, that's the right screen. Thank you so much. So folks, hello. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. It's a really it's, a, it's really a pleasure to join you today. Thank, thanks, Paz and Open Life Science for the invitation. I'm going to talk about licenses. I'm not a lawyer, but that's a slide. I am Anna, and most people will know me as one of the Outreachy organizers. Outreachy is a program that provides three months internships in open source and open science. But what most people don't know about my work is that uh, I have a fancy title, which is Process and Information Architect. 
so behind the scenes um all about analyzing and revamping our processes and organizational documentation and also improving the way we deliver information in Alpharetti. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Uh, this is not my first time talking about licenses. A few years ago, uh, back in 2018, I was one of the research assistants involved with Tynacan. Tynacan is a free and open source project uh, in Brazil. It helps uh, GLAMS, which are galleries, libraries, archives, and museums to share their digital collections and exhibitions powered by WordPress. Uh, in the photo, that's me talking to many of these museums employees about Creative Commons and Multimedia Commons. I was part of one of the most European leaders cohort at the time, and that helped me immensely to navigate very complex themes in open leadership. And one of the things that I know for sure people struggle a lot is licensing. So go ahead for the next slide, please. So as an alum, I know that I've learned that my goal as an open leader is to design new projects and empower others to collaborate within inclusive communities. And this framework is one of the things that have helped me at every single job that I had that require facilitation, collaboration, and inclusiveness. Next slide. And when we talk about, when we talk about licensing, licensing, this topic falls under the box of building for sharing. And as important as is to know what to share and where to share, we need to, sh we need to know how to share the things that we want to share. Next slide. And yeah, the act of sharing requires some thought. The internet makes it seem so easy to share, modify, and forward everything you see, but things aren't as they seem. Code and known code projects have boundaries just as we have them. For instance, I use CC by SA on my blog, so people can share and adapt my blog posts as long as they give me the appropriate credit and they share it under the same license. I'm still the copyright holder, but I'm telling people, hey, these are my boundaries for the things that I write. Now, even though it can be legal to use work share with an open license without attribution, that's still a violation of academic ethics. And if you look at many of the biggest projects working with open licensing, you will seldom see them doing something like this. Next slide. As an open leader, you want to consider three things when choosing a license, permission to use, modify, and share. You may have heard about this before if you are familiar with the Libre software or free software movement, which is based on four freedoms freedom to run a program as you wish, freedom to study how it works and change it as you wish, freedom to redistribute copies so you can help others and freedom to redistribute copies of your modified versions too. We'll come back to this in a minute, so put a pin on this. Next slide. Now, library or open licenses don't necessarily mean no attribution. People may renounce their right as a copyright holder with licenses such as CC0, but licenses such as CC BY or CC BY SA, as I mentioned earlier, require attribution. That's what the BY in CC BY or CC BY SA means. Next slide. Now, remember when I talked about the free software movement and the four freedoms? Another thing that's big in the free software movement is copyleft. It is there to preserve the central freedoms of its users. It requires all their thief works to be shared under the same license. This is why you may see lawsuits against companies that have used GPL code, but refuse to share their version of the source code. They are not following the copyleft nature of the GPL license. non copyleft license, on the other hand, do not have this requirement. Next slide. Another thing is intellectual property law is very complex and 
pa patents and copyright are distinct concepts. Copyright is an automatic right. Patents are registered right involving uh, completely different processes. So if this is something that interests you, you should talk to a lawyer. Next slide. Well, how do people add licenses to the work? They're usually in the root directory, possibly on a file called license. You may include more than one license, but you have to be very explicit and intentional about this. Next slide. And as you mentioned on this way, a license designed for data or creative works may not be appropriate for code, they require different licenses. Next slide. For instance, these are some of the licenses you may want to use for software, BSD, MIT, GPL. For, con for context, you may use, for content you may use uh, CC0, CC BY, CC BY SA. For data, CC0 is recommended. You may technically use CC BY or CC BY SA on data, but it may cause issues with data sets down the road. There are a couple of articles about this. I can share some of them later. You can also license software with CC0, but it's technically not an OSI, OSI approved license. So technically that won't be open source. And another thing to note is CC0, CC BY and CC BY SA are the three approved for free cultural work CC licenses. And you may see them uh, on no code uh, contributions like Wikimedia Commons. So Wikimedia Commons, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with, with that project, is a huge archive and collection of photographs, videos, etc. And they, I share on these on the further reading section, they have a couple of rules regarding what kinds of licenses they may use to share those photographs. And CC0, CC BY, and CC BY SA are the ones that they recommend. Next slide. So GitHub has a couple of ways you can add licenses. If, he, if this is your first time you're creating a repository, you can choose a license right away. They have many license templates ready to use, including Creative Commons. This is something new. A couple of years ago, they didn't have that. And in this interface, when you're creating your repository, it's just a matter of choosing uh, one of the licenses that you see here in the drop down menu or filtering and searching for a specific license. Next slide. But if you want to add one after creating a repository, so maybe you want to create a repository to get that beautiful uh, project name, but you haven't decided on the license yet you can add it after the fact. It's just a matter of creating a file called license, all caps in the root repository. This is something that GitHub will recognize as a license file and it will trigger a button so you can choose a license template, just like the drop-down menu in the slide prior. Next slide. So the too long didn't read version of this talk is basically you need a license so others can build off your work. It's something that you use to establish boundaries and to also help others to use that work. You give them uh, some guarantees, you give them uh, some security when they're using work because you'll be able to tell them, hey, I, I think that it's appropriate for you to um, give me credit or I want you to use the same license I'm using, and those are perfectly okay boundaries to have. You must use different licenses for code data and content because they are not the same thing and they entail different usages. So you need to account for that. And here are some examples of good permissive defaults for licenses. So code, a lot of people will use MIT license for writing docs or for sharing images, a lot of people will use CC BY, and for data, the recommended license is CC0. Next slide. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, I added a resource from Wikimedia Commons where they go into details about licensing and copyright laws in a couple of countries. I think it's a really interesting 
research and a um, resource and example of how a large scale project will deal with licensing, especially come from different parts of the world and different people. It's a really interesting project to watch from afar. Next slide. And that's all. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to have this conversation about licenses. And I'm available to talk about uh, glands and licensing and some of the challenges that we may face when choosing a license. I know something that I want to recommend is you may want to follow uh, the work of organizations as software freedom conservancy. They do a lot of work in licensing enforcement and they have some really cool blog posts about the kind of enforcing they do, like the lawsuit they have with Visio, where Visio is not following GPL licensing agreements. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. Folks, can we have a round of applause for Anna for that fantastic and informative talk? Amazing. Um, so I'm going to ask questions to go in the etherpad. Um, I know that this particular licensing talk, basically everyone has a question. Um, and we, we end up, we, honestly, I suspect we could have an hour just doing Q&A on licensing where people think, but what about my specific scenario? Um, Anna, if you were able to take a look at some of the notes in the questions, it's line 159 where we can throw those questions in if you have specific questions. Um, and Anna's got experience with this, as do a lot of the people probably in the call. Um, so I'm sure that collectively we can answer some of those um, questions around licensing. And I can see already we have a note about someone who's had bad experience with people stealing and monetizing work. Uh, wow that sounds tough i i really want to dig in um i'm going to just leave it because unfortunately we want to make sure that our other speakers have time to talk and that we're respecting their time for having come along as well um let me see emmy would you like to introduce uh, the next presentation that sounds good to me thank you so much anna uh, for that presentation it's always refreshing uh to, to hear everyone's sort of experience and perspective with that, but especially yours as well. Thank you. Our next presentation is going to be about another very important topic. So README files, and you're very happy to have Alexander here today with us. Um, Alexander, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, please, can you give me a screen share permission to the screen user? I, I have two personalities here. One is a screen, Alexander Martinez. Sure. Uh, just, yes, I see you now and I'm just going ahead. Oh, I actually don't have the, oh, someone's done it. You should no. be co-host now. <laughs> okay. So. Please let me know if you see my, my screen. Yeah, okay. So, uh, hi to everyone. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about the readme files in this cohort uh, session. So, I'm um, Alexander Martinez. I am a system engineer, but it uh, really is something like a comp computer scientist uh, in Colombia. Uh, my two affiliations are uh, the Industrial University of Santander in, in Colombia and the Laconga Physics Project. This is an Erasmus Plus project. So uh, let, let's talk about the, the topic. Uh, uh, for the agenda today, I have two four, four points. First, I'm going to talk uh, about the definition of readme, what a readme is, and what is not a readme. Uh, then I'm going to, to talk about the, the importance of readme for, for your project. Uh, then I'm going to give you a quick guide on how to write a readme. And finally, I'm going to do you uh, some examples to, uh, for readme. Um, so, readme. Uh, 
in, in, in just a sentence, this is a very important thing for the project, a very important element. And this is a clear example of what is not a readme. This is, this is not a readme, this is a meaningless, meaningless test and a short test. This is, this is very common in, in some projects. So uh, uh, what is a readme? Historically, it started uh, a long time ago to, to, to take form uh, what, what the readme is. But I, I don't want to go to, to history because the time is, 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 no, is not enough. So uh, in the definition, this is the readme is the first thing uh, people get, uh, the, the first thing what, what people see when came to the project. So uh, when uh, a potential contributor came to your project, the first thing they, they are going to see is your, is your readme. So you have to be a very nice readme. Uh, and you have to be a, a document that help, that help people to get started in, in your project, to introduce you. Uh, if you are the user or the contributor, a readme they have to introduce you uh, to the project you are going to. Um, so in, in, in a technical way, a readme is a file that is in the root of your project or your repository, generally uh, a Git repository. And but convention, but con by convention, this is uh, called readme in all caps, readme. And it could have uh, some uh, extension like TST, M uh, Markdown. And it could be uh, also be re reusable to to create landing page or, or something like this. So uh, trying to, to, to get to the importance of, of readme, uh, I'm going to make an analogy. An analogy. Um, this is uh, a welcome mat. It's like the readme is like a wel welcome mat. As I say, this is the first thing people see when, uh, when they came to your project. So they, this is the first thing. And this is, this is a single screen view of your project. So you have to be very nice. It's, it's like an abstract for a paper. If, if, an, if an abstract is not very good, nobody is going to the whole document of, the, of your paper. So a readme have to be very, very good. Um, but also it, this is a tool to orient the, the people that came to your project to, to use or to, to contribute to your project. And this is a tool to encourage people or newcomers to, to participate, participate in your project. So uh, uh, what, what is not a readme? Uh, uh, this is not the only or comprehensive documentation of your project. So this is, as I say, this is just a, uh, a single screen view. You have to be somewhere. You have to summarize your project and all the things you want to people to to get through to the project. And um, definitely, uh, definitely the image I showed you before. This is not this is not a read. So um, it is uh, when when we write, write a, a reading, it's important to to have a clear understanding of our projects. And also a clear, a, clear, a clear understanding of the audience of, of your project. Uh, here in Colombia, I don't know how popular this is in, in the world, but there is a popular saying that says uh, in Spanish, te tienes que poner en los zapatos de alguien más. In English, you have to put yourself in someone else's shoes. You have to, to try many sides, the size of the audience you, you are going to, to get. And also, uh, it could be a, a, a more uh, a more broader community. If you want to reach a more broader community, you have to try many many show sites. And you have to keep in mind that that many people outside the project or the people you are you are thinking about could be interested in, in contributing to your project. So you, when you write a, a readme, you have to to get all of the people to to get through. And but, well, so fortunately, uh, uh, you have all open life science to, to help you uh, get a, a nice readme for your project. And especially it's a tool uh, uh, that I, I think you already see it. 
that uh, was uh, the open canvas. This is the, the perfect tool to, to, to start writing a, a, a review. Um, now, now I'm going to, to give you some survival guides, some, some quick uh, and short guide on how to, a general guide on how to write a readme. Um, the first thing you have to do, even uh, when, when you start writing a, a, a readme, you have to be polite. You have to welcome people to, to your project. You have to say hello in, in a nice way. Then they, they, they have to be like, like your first paragraph in, the, in, your, in your readme. And then you have to describe uh, very clear your project. You have to answer questions to people like, what are you doing? Uh, with who are you working and for who are you working and why are you doing this with your project? Uh, then you have to, to help people to, to get started with your project. So users or contributors, you have to, to try to make it easy for them to, to get started with, with your project. Um, and finally, you have to, to state why resources are uh, most needed for for working or using your project. Uh, uh, things like tools, skills, expertise of the people, everything else that, that is necessary to, to get through your project. Um, right, the, the, this was the, the, the template for, for, for writing a project. You can, you can also use some, some elements to, to make it a, a, a better, a better readme, you, have, you can use uh, some badge, badges to, to provide more information about the status of your project. If this is a deployable, uh, deployable project, you can put the, some like buttons to tell people how is, how is it going. You can use also some links, like in the example, uh, in our project Laconga, we use the social network links to, to help uh, to try to make it easy for people to, to, contact, to, to, to contact us. Uh, you can also use emojis to, to make it more friendly in, in this way, especially when you welcome people. Uh, uh, you can also use a GIF or, or image to, to explain technical or conceptual things of your project. Uh, finally, you can also, for some projects, it's, it's important to, to have translation, maybe not the whole document translated to another language, but some, some, some elements of your readme to, to, to help people in another country, in another culture to, to understand what uh, are you doing and, or even how to contact you. Uh, in general, you can use Markdown to, to, to style your, your readme and make it a nice array. And the final advice is that uh, rewrite your readme whenever it's necessary. A readme is a living element, so it, it must evolve with, with your project. You have to uh, put new things to, uh, to keep it updated with, with the status of the project. Uh, so I, I'm going to, to show you a, a, brief, a brief example of what a readme is. So here we, we have a uh, Sorry, sorry if you are not seeing my, my pointer. Mm -hmm. uh, you are seeing a, a welcome message that, that, that say hi to people. Uh, then they describe the, the project very, 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 very quickly, but, but, but in a clear way. And then they have, the, uh, the, this is important. Uh, some some limits are uh, uh, a bit extensive. So it, it's good to have a table of content. To, to make it easier to get to the content people are interested. And some of the things that this is important to have in a readme are elements like the license, the previous one uh, Anne was talking, uh, the code of conduct, and so, uh, the, the other elements that are on the, on the repository. So I think I'm getting out of time, but it's okay. Uh, finally, I leave you a uh, a list of good example, good readme examples. I, I really like the, the Turing way readme. This is the, the, the thing I 
uh, take to everywhere, <laughs> the, the Turing way. Um, uh, the second link is the is a guy from Alex Chan, who previously uh, in the cohort, I think was in the third, in the third cohort. Uh, uh, in the third cohort, I was talking about dreams. And uh, the last items are some uh, reference for, for emojis uh, and a guide to, well, a cheat sheet to, to mark down. And finally, I want to acknowledge the people to Alex, Mateus, and Rainier for, for the previous slides on, on OLS, and to all of you to, for being here. And now it's time for the question. I, I think I used the time you gave me. Thank you so much, Alex. Round of applause for that talk. Ah, uh, I'm sorry for the barbarities I may committed with, with my English. <laughs> No worries. You were very, very clear. And um, I love the quote about, you know, really stepping into people's shoes and understanding. And it's an, it's an English phrase as well, I think. I think. Um, but yeah, stepping into people's shoes and understanding from their viewpoint what's needed, what do they need to understand the project and, and to be able to contribute. Love, love, love that so much. Folks, um, I think we are we're running a little bit short on time. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, I would really encourage you to put it on the Etherpad under 170, line 170, or uh, alternatively, you know, if it comes to you, which usually does for me when you're actually writing your readme's, um, please put them on the, on the Slack channel as well to share with the rest of the cohort in the community. It's the best way to get a lot of ideas. As you can see, um, and you can add to that as well, uh, your ideas for your tips for writing good readme's that you've seen meeting other people's project readme's. If you have them, um, there's already a growing list under line 174. So add your tips. We love collecting them um, and we love to learn from each other through that, that, that way. Thank you so, so much, Alexander, uh, for the talk um, once again. Um, and I'm sorry to be speeding through this, but I really want to make sure that we have enough time to, to uh, so that all our speakers can uh, share their uh, presentations. Um, very, very happy to have uh, Sebastian next will be talking to us about contributing guidelines and codes of conduct. Um, I think Alex, you might need to stop sharing first there we go thank you so much and then sebastian whenever you're ready mm, okay so now uh, can you see my presentation beautiful thank you that's great so um, hello everyone uh, now um, i am going to talk to you about how to create a positive uh, culture in your project by creating a contributed guideline and code of conduct so my name is Sebastian Ayala, and I am a master's student at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And I am a community member of the OLS, the Carpentries, Streamlit, and other communities. So let's start. Um, first of all, we should uh, know the concept of project culture, which refers to the idea of having a community around your project. And this community will be diverse. And I really like this illustration by the Turing Way project in which they depict the different types of diversity that you can have in your project. So you can have different types of languages, cultures, time zones, gender, and other things. And in, as, as leaders, it's important to think about what are the values and behaviors that you expect that um, other people uh, follow in, in your project. Um, another important concept is that um, your project is more than its goals. So in this illustration, again, from the, uh, by, by the Turing way, uh, you can see that um, in the top of the iceberg, uh, there are the general things about the project, such as the goals, but behind the iceberg, you have a lot of important things, such as the code of conduct, the inclusiveness, the tools that you use, uh, among other uh, important things that you should think about. Uh, so um, to create uh, your project culture, um, you should you should create uh, the contributed guidelines and a code of conduct. 
So uh, first of all, what is a contribution? So this is the way in which um, your collaborators will um, be engaged with the project and the community. And it's important to mention that there are different types of contributions and these are not only coding because your collaborators can help you to plan events, to uh, um, do some designs or to improve the documentations, uh, answering questions, uh, among other um, types of, of collaborator collaborations. So you should think about what are the um, what are the types of um, contributions that you expect from the, your community members? And um, all of these ideas uh, can be written in this contributing uh, file um, that you can put in your GitHub repository. Uh, so it's important to have this file because it helps you to uh, structure your contributions. Uh, it provides uh, guidelines for your collaborators and creates a, um, a standard style um, for your project. And it um, invites new people uh, for your project. And by reading this file, um, your, con your collaborators um, know what are the uh, standards uh, on how to um, collaborate uh, in the project and um, the consumers can reuse this file in their own projects. So now I will show you some examples um, of these contribution guidelines. So the first one is from the Turing way and here you can see that um, uh, you have a table of contents um, about how uh, you can collaborate in, in the project and you have a, a specific sub subsection about how to get in touch um, with the community and here also you have um, different um, activities that allows the community members to get in touch um, with, um, with the project in general and as you can see in, in this particular project, there are, there are different types of uh, collaborations and, and different types of activities that you can use to be in touch with the community. And here I have another example from the I, iGraph software. And here you can see that the types of collaborations are more restricted. So they put that um, you, you can collaborate by uh, answering some questions in forums to improve the documentations and trying to answer some issues in the GitHub repo. So uh, it's good to think about what are the uh, specific um, collaborations that you expect from your, uh, your collaborators. And here I have another example from Alphapol in which the um, um, expectations uh, about collaborations are even more restricted. So they only have to receive uh, small changes and uh, this is because it's, this is more um, an, an industry software. So you should think about um, what um, are the types of collaborations and you should put it clearly in your uh, contributing uh, guideline. Um, also, you can create a contributors page and here is an example of the Carpentries um, webpage. So if you have a detailed guideline um, for your contributors, you can um, create a, a page in, in your Git page about it. And here is another example from the Scikit-learn uh, Python package about it. And uh, also here, I, uh, I leave some resources um, of uh, open source projects in which you can search for similar projects to yours and look at the contributed guidelines there. And okay, so now we have a diverse community and everyone knows how to collaborate in the project. Um, but what happens if something um, that is not accepted um, uh, occurs? So in this case, um, the code of conduct uh, comes into play. So basically the code of conduct is a set of rules that says people what is uh, accepted and what is not accepted in, in the project and the community and how you can deal with uh, potential issues. And um, some of you maybe are wondering if uh, this is really needed because maybe this is something that 
um, is kind of obvious or something like that. But uh, in reality, this document uh, helps you to set um, clear expectations on your community members and tells the contributors um, that you cared about the community. Uh, so um, it's important to have this file and put uh, clearly uh, what are the expected behaviors and unaccepted, uh, uh, unaccepted uh, behaviors for your community. And here I have an example from the PyCon conference and how to create this code of conduct. So first you have an, an overall uh, explanation about the project. Then you have some details about what are the accepted behaviors and also not accepted behaviors. Also, you have a subsection about the enforcement procedures. Uh, that means um, how you will apply this code of conduct. And also you have a subsection on the procedures for handling potential incidents or issues. Uh, which is important to to put, and also how you can contact the organizers of the of the project to handle this issue, and also um, they um, provide what is the license um, of this code of conduct, and also they refer to previous code of conduct that they used to create this one. So it's important to mention this because you can use previous code of conducts and you can adapt them for your uh, specific project. Uh, so here I leave some examples that you can see and, and, and you can see if this is suitable for your project and you can adapt them. And, um, and now I think that it's your turn to think about um, what are the values and expected behaviors that you want to share in your community. Uh, and in, in the community that is around your project, right? And then you, you should think about what are the uh, potential issues that can appear and how you will handle this. And it's important to mention that this depends on the uh, on, on the project leader to, to, to think about how to handle this type of potential issues. So um, I think that that's it. And um, thank you very much to Emma, Malvika, Lily, and Karin for the slides of previous all this cohort. And thank you very much to everyone um, for hearing me. And I am happy to answer questions if, if you have any. Thank you so much, so much, Sebastian. Big round of applause for that really important uh, talk and so many important messages there as well. Folks, um, if you have any questions um, regarding the talk or anything around this issue, um, this topic that we, you would like to discuss with us or ask, ask uh, Sebastian and those who are in the cohort, please do share them on the Zoom chat or in the Etherpad. We are at around one, line 196 there. Sebastian, we do have a, a question. Um, do you have any advice on reusing code of conducts from other projects into your own? Mm, yes, I think that it's important to search, to, to look for um, similar projects that are aligned to um, the values that you want to share in your project. And um, you, you can, uh, depending on the license uh, of, of the code of conduct, you can adapt uh, them and uh, reshare it. So I think that it's important to look for similar projects. And, and also it's important to think about what are the values that you want to share. And in this way, you can um, use previous information, but also uh, put a specific information about your project, which is very important. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, and someone's adding onto the the etherpad as well. So I don't know if you you'd like to vocalize there, but um, I I see. Yes, I will. I will uh, reply by the. Uh, no, thank you. I just wonder the person who just typed that comment about wording. If you would like to. Vocalize oh yeah, that's that. me. Oh, thank you. Do you want to so, talk more about it? Yeah. Yes. So I have the experience of reviewing a code of code of conduct. So in Outreachy, when a community joins us, one of the things that we will read and 
talk to them about is their code of conduct. And one of the things that I advise communities to do is if you're looking into like getting a code of conduct as an example, so you see there's this really good community. They're really good at enforcing their code of conduct. They have some really nice principles that you, you identify with and you want to apply in your community. I will be careful to read that code of conduct and uh, see if there's any problematic wording. So uh, maybe something that they have not considered, maybe some insensitive cultural difference that they may have with things that you uh, may, things that you may not agree with. And also I would be careful to um, see if the code of tongue of the, their COC really uh, works for the context that you have your own community. So for instance, a uh, code of conduct for a uh, in-person event may not be as a good as a good choice as something that is for virtual virtual events, for instance. So for in-person events that they may not consider uh, some virtual interactions or things that may happen in a virtual environment. Uh, whereas uh, virtual communities will think about those kind of interactions and they will have some provisions. They will have and something in their code of conduct that will consider some dangerous situations in a virtual community, like um, people harassing someone else via DMs or maybe someone uh, uh, following someone in another path platform and they, they, did, they did set a boundary that they didn't want to be contacted on that platform. There are some really uh, context specific things that may happen in certain communities that you may need to take into account when you are writing your own code of conduct. Thank you so much for that. That is such an, such an important consideration there. Um, it's, I, <laughs> uh, I, I, I always like at, at this point sort of like, you know, it's always really important to have a code of conduct. Um, there is, it is quite a technical and important and, you know, you need all this careful considerations. Well, so I, I always sort of think about, you know, is there, you know, what's some of the tips that Sebastian's also mentioned about, you know, how do you set this up first and then understanding that this is also what a process you know, a code of conduct is not a static piece of work, right? It's that it evolves over time and then you can continue to sort of improve it uh, with it yes. once you've created a safe community there. Um, so thank you another so much. Thing, for, yeah. Another thing please. that I want to mention, and I just thought about that is, it's really important, as important it is to have a code of conduct and have that in a written format and make everyone know there is a code of conduct for your community. It's also important to have a team of people that will enforce it, people that will deal with the reports, people that will talk to the person who is reporting an incident, to the reported person. It's important to uh, be aware of that terminology so you can analyze an, an incident and you can act on that incident. It's also important to account that sometimes you may receive reports from uh, that are related to people that are in the enforcement team and you need to account for those too. So it's a really complex and really important part of uh, moderating and facilitating communications and collaboration within a community. And those are some of the things that you may want to consider when you are writing your own code of conduct. Thank you so much. One hundred percent, and and I I would also share the flag that as Susanna shared a really important input in this in the chat as well about you know sort of telling people that code of conduct is applied in a certain occasion and repeating that as well uh, to make sure that you know people felt more aware but also hopefully more confident to to um, you know. Uh, act on some of the provisions that are allowed within the code of conduct. What's a tripping up here? Sorry. Thank you so much uh, once again to Sebastian and, and to everyone else who contributed to this. Um, I am looking at the clock. We have a little breakout room that we planned. <laughs> 
we may ha just about have enough time to, to do a little short exercise, uh, which is quite fun. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna try and open this for the next five minutes. Uh, I'm gonna put you all back in the same groups that you had before and speakers, if you want to step out of this, feel free as well. Um, but essentially, um, we'd love you to uh, do a little exercise by putting your uh, vision statement into a tool called UpGoer5. The link of that is on line 208. Um, and just have a go. And um, let the people in your breakout room know how you're finding this and also sharing out that insight in the etherpad if you can. Lots of things. <laughs> let me know if any of that is unclear, please. Uh, but I'm gonna open the, oh, someone else is opening them. Thank you. You're off. It is, um, Pauline is doing it. Oh, Pauline, thank you so much. Wonderful. I'm just oh. pause the recording right here as well. Um, or landing page for your project. Um, and also link, put, put the link of the README on the issue, in the same issue. And um, add an open license uh, to your repository. And what the instructions are in the pad, you can just check them later. And um, also add a code of conduct uh, to your repository uh, and yeah, name it code of conduct as, as in the pad. Um, and uh, next week we're gonna have a GitHub introduction um, session for those who are new to GitHub. Uh, I'm gonna attend that session because I'm new to GitHub. <laughs> and um, so do attend even if you are <clears throat> an expert on GitHub that could help the rest of the mentees if you have time and if you want. Um, so that's it. Uh, super happy to see you all, although I'm looking at the pad right now, I'm not seeing you, but <laughs> I don't know how you does it. Anyways. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Pass. And thank you so much to uh, Anna, Sebastian, and Alex. Uh, for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a good week. Enjoy your morning, afternoon, evening. See you. Yeah, in exactly. Next thank week. Thank you, Anna, Alex, Sebastian, and everyone. And Malvika. <laughs>